All right, hey folks, um, welcome to our SOSV webinar series. Um, and this week, we're gonna be talking to the folks at Kickstarter. Uh, we're calling it kicking off with Kickstarter. So, um, you know, we brought a couple experts in from the Kickstarter team. We're gonna talk a little bit about the work they do about Kickstarter and about building um, you know, a successful Kickstarter campaign. We have uh, plenty of our teams have gone through hacks um, which obviously kind of relies on the Kickstarter model, but we have had a lot of interest from folks outside of Hacks who wanna know how they can get things started. So um, I have Terry and Julio here. They're gonna introduce themselves and then do a quick presentation on uh, getting Kickstarter, getting a Kickstarter campaign off the ground, um, and then we'll have time for some questions. So in the interim, um, for folks tuning in at home, I've enabled the Q&A app in Google Hangouts, so if you have questions, you can drop them in there. Um, but uh, other than that, we'll get started. So I'll turn it over to Terry and Julio, who can uh, first maybe just talk a little bit about yourselves, uh, how you came, maybe came to Kickstarter, uh, and, then, and then I'll let you guys dive right in. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Connor. So, so it's great to, to, to be here and, and to talk to you guys about Kickstarter. Um, we'll start off with, our, again, a brief introduction, then we'll jump into a few slides. So I am Julio, and I am the uh, outreach lead on the tech and design team, and um, this is my colleague. Uh, Hi, I'm Terry, and I'm the outreach lead for food and crafts here at Kickstarter. And, and both of us, you know, uh, I think we both have very different paths to come to Kickstarter, but, you know, my, my background is working a lot on, you know, things, uh, digital installations. Um, I've worked for a long time in marketing. Um, and, and, you know, for the last two years and a half, I've been here at Kickstarter. Pretty much my, my job entails working with creators, providing them, you know, um, leading workshops and providing creators with coaching and tips to help them develop and run successful campaigns. And I do a similar thing uh, like Julia does here. I coach people, I give them tips, I help them run their campaigns here at Kickstarter, but for food and for crafts. And I have a background. I've been writing cookbooks for over 10 years. I've worked in restaurants. I've worked in food product development, uh, design packaging, uh, you know, marketing. I've even worked on food trucks. So uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of different food experience here. Great. So, so what we'll do is we're going to uh, just um, share our slides, and then we'll start um, going through that. So give us just one second and um, and we'll get going. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, can I, you know, right now um, what we're doing this, we have about, you know, 40 slides that should take us about somewhere between 30 minutes and 40 minutes to go through. Um, and once that's done, we'll, we'll leave the, the, the final 40 minutes to uh, answer your questions. So just really quickly, you know, we had two slides to, to do intros, but since we've already done the intros, I'm just going to skip over that, and we'll get right into the good stuff. So as you all know, you know, Kickstarter uh, is a funding website, but we have a pretty specific focus. Uh, our focus is really, you know, um, a platform where people can create things to share with others. And those creative, um, you know, projects can focus on things, of course, food, tech, and design, which are the two, you know, categories that Terry and I represent, but also on other things like films, games, um, oh, comics. Julie, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just switch to um, the, the the current window that you're showing the presentation? And I think that's different from the one that we're seeing on the screen. Or maybe okay, not. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's not. Um, I'm trying to see what we can do, but but it's. Um, that's a keynote right now, so I would go to back to, yeah. Can you can you see it? Because I mean, for us, it's showing it's, 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 from on our screen. It shows that it's sharing. Yeah, I can um, see. We can I, see the um, the keynote keynote itself. We can't see like a presentation mode for it. Maybe that's okay. Oh. Um, unfortunately, um, um, I don't. Un unfortunately, that there's. I mean, for us, it shows as if the presentation is showing here when we look at the. Um, Google um, Hangout little screen. Okay, um, we're on slide. We're on slide four. We can see the side menu. So, okay, great. Cool. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it open to the menu so that way. Um, here, I'll slide that. All right. So, uh, this is a little bit about Kickstarter. I mean, to date, there's been over ninety four thousand projects funded. Uh, that's actually two billion dollars pledged to projects, and those dollars have been pledged really from all over the world. 
And the U.S. is, of course, our, our strongest market. It's where we've been live the longest. But now we're live for creators, not just in the U.S., but pretty much through all of Europe and all English-speaking countries around the world. But again, that's where we're live for creators, but backers really you know, have spanned the globe, which is really amazing. And, and in terms of the number of backers, there's been you know, around 9.7 million backers, and 30% of those backers are repeat backers. So those are people who have come and have backed multiple projects on Kickstarter, which is something that you know, gets us really excited because yeah. you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is build a community of people who are celebrating creativity in all these different ways. Um, a quick overview of some of you know the products that we've seen because one of the things that excites us also about this type of funding is is you know not just um, like the fact that you can bring things to life but but also the impact that these projects can have on on culture you know in a larger sense. I mean we've had projects that have won um, Oscars. Um, we've had projects that have you know that are now in the permanent collection of prominent museums around the world. Uh, we've, and also, we've just had some really amazing things being brought to life, like creative tools like the 3 Boodler, which, you know, which is a 3D printing pen that um, you know, really kind of took uh, you know, 3D printing to a, a more kind of ephemeral, fun, creative um, kind of artistic place. And then we also have things like people sending, people, uh, people sending things into space, you know, even everything from you know, serious projects that are actually trying to develop serious uh, future designs for, for spacecrafts even, but also silly projects like sending pizza yeah, slices into slice space. Pizza into space. Yeah. Someday you can do that too. <laughs> Great. So, so now that we've kind of given this uh, broad overview, let's talk a little bit about how it works. We're, we're first going to talk about how it works broadly, then we'll actually dive into very specific, you know, kind of best practices about different parts of the storytelling process. So the first thing about how it works is that Kickstarter is a site where you know for a project to, to, to go live on Kickstarter, there's a few core rules. They're actually very simple. The first is that a Kickstarter project needs to fit into one of these 15 categories. I know that most of the, the you know uh, companies coming out of the SOS Ventures um, portfolio are in you know design, technology, and food primarily. I mean uh, also because you know bio uh, related and science related projects tend to fall into the technology category. Uh, but beyond that, that first rule that, that a product has to fit into one of these categories, we also require that products are, of course, transparent and honest. And there are certain things that we prohibit, like, you know, we don't allow fundraising for charity. We also don't allow, you know, um, financial incentives to be used. And, of course, uh, you can't run a product for anything that is illegal. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I'd like to note is that our creators choose what category they're going to be into. So that is really up to you. Yeah, and, and, and especially, I mean, I think I, I'm the food lover in the tech category, so there's definitely a lot of projects that me yeah. and Terry will collaborate on that might be, you know, devices for making food and, and, and whatnot. And, and sometimes um, a creator will choose to put that in the food category, other times they'll choose to put that in the design category. So um, Kickstarter is an all or nothing funding platform. And, you know, this image here of this project page, uh, we just put it here because it, it shows two of the core elements of an all or nothing funding model. One of them is, of course, the goal. You know, and in this project page here, the goal is this $12,000 um, pledge requirement. And then there is the second element of an all or nothing funding campaign is a time frame. Um, and the way that it works, of course, is that you need to meet that goal within the time frame. And there are a few reasons why we only allow um, campaigns that, that are all or nothing. And, and the first and foremost is that we do find that this limits risk. Because if you're a backer, you know that your money is not going to change hand unless the creator is able to raise enough money to bring their project to life. So you're not going to end up giving somebody money um, and, and have that money go to them and them not be able to actually complete uh, the project or, or have the resources to attempt to complete that project um, in a full manner. And from a creator perspective, you're not going to get money unless you get enough money to bring your product to life. So you're not going to have a community of backers that are expecting you to deliver on a vision that you're not able to deliver because you don't have the resources um, to deliver on that vision. And beyond this kind of risk consideration, we also find that it's, you know, this model is more compelling. You know, your backers actually have an incentive to promote what you're doing to their communities because they know if they care about what you're doing, they know that that's not going to come to life unless they're able to help you reach that base goal. 
Um, and, and I think the numbers do prove that this model is compelling because 40% of, of projects on Kickstarter are successful. And that is a really awesome number. You know, it's, it's, um, it's great to see. And, and, you know, another important thing to, to, to consider is that um, um, pretty much 60% of, of uh, dollars um, that are pledged to Kickstarter are from creators. And this is something awesome because, again, it goes back to this notion of community, uh, which is a big focus of ours, not only community at, at the site level, but we also talk a lot to creators about community at their project level, which is something that we'll get to a little bit later. Yeah. All right, so so just uh, you know, we want to show a few examples of of products in the you know design tech and food categories, and and many of these are actually products from the SOS Ventures um, you know uh, portfolio. So you know, these are some products we really love. I mean, first is you know the the Spark, which um, you know now is called Particle, but you know an amazing uh, you know project from an amazing team, and uh, and what's really special about this project is that now you know, Particle is actually used to power a lot of other projects on Kickstarter. So what, what began as a, you know, a product that was launched on Kickstarter to create a, a platform for uh, creators, for, for, you know, makers, engineers to develop Internet of Things objects has now, you know, become, you know, the platform that is used by over 20 projects that have, you know, launched on Kickstarter. And this is one I really love. This is a cultured coffee bean. Now, unlike most coffee that is usually just roasted and lightly fermented, this bean has been fermented uh, by a bioscientist to emulate the kind of coffee that comes from Pacific coffee from the Southeast Asian region. It has a very deep, uh, rich profile, and it really, uh, really attracted an incredible uh, amount of backers and support for something <laughs> really unique that just has really never existed before. Um, and this is, you know, another product from the, the SOS portfolio. It's called Print, and it's a product that essentially turns your 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 phone into a polar uh, into a Polaroid type camera, so that you can actually take pictures and print them out and share them with your friends as a physical picture. Um, again, really, really awesome project. Um, you know, that did an amazing job at, at bringing to life this uh, this desire that we all have now to. You know, go from digital back to physical. You know, I think we've all gotten a little tired of, all of the purely digital existence that we're <laughs> increasingly living. And speaking of something not digital at all, uh, a little bit outside of SOS, but still a great inspirational project. This is a salt created by Angelo Garo's team, who taught Michael Pollan how to forage for wild mushrooms, how to hunt a boar. Uh, so this is a wonderful uh, handmade product that is uh, definitely has a very much like a very foodie angle to it that uh, again connected uh, with an enormous community, an enormous amount of backers on Kickstarter and really just has brought an incredible product to life in the world. So now that we've shown these examples uh, of, of products that we kind of love in these categories, let's talk a little bit about what it takes to develop a product that, that can succeed uh, like these ones that we just showed. Um, so there's a few areas, or, or, or I, I often talk about these as tools that you have, storytelling tools that you have to bring a project to life on Kickstarter. And we'll go through each one of these in, in more detail on the slides to come. But just, you know, um, the five uh, things we're going to talk about is the title and project image, the, you know, project video, project description, rewards, and project updates. So let's start with the, you know, title and project image. This is really what enables you to entice your prospective backers. I mean, this is the one thing that they see before they even click into your project and are mm -hmm. able to see your full story in your project yeah. page. So as you can imagine, you know, this is a really, as much as these are, you know, small elements in your project, they're extremely important. Right. Their importance is oversized. Um, we, we like to talk about these as the most visible parts of your project. Because this is a part of your project that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot more people, a lot of people will see that will never see the rest of your project. And can I add to, increasingly, more and more of our users are mobile. And uh, definitely, like, uh, if you look at the mobile app on Kickstarter, which is fantastic, uh, definitely, you should definitely check that out in addition to the web one. This is what people is going to hit them first. They're going to see the title, and they're going to see that great image that you select. Yeah, and, and so, there's a few things that you should always keep in mind when, when selecting an image. Um, you know, keep that image clear and compelling and don't, don't you know, make that image too busy. You know, don't try to fit too many things in the image because then it just gets, it's going to get cluttered and it will be really hard to read it in thumbnail size. Um, you definitely should, you know, when you're, when you're 
selecting a project image, you know, do mock it up in thumbnail size. Do mock it up in, in, in the size that, that it would appear. Uh, we do actually, in the project build, we do so what, what we call uh, the baseball card, which is the baseball card is how the search results show up on Kickstarter. We do show you how your image will look on a baseball card on, on the project build. So that's, that's, that helps you a little bit there. But, um, you know, an exercise that I've seen some creators do is they'll actually get their little baseball card and mock it up in a in a, like a mock page with a bunch of other you know baseball cards. So you can see how does that how does my project stand out in a page full of other projects that that um, you know um, look somewhat similar in the way that they're presented. Um, from the copy perspective, you should really be descriptive. You know, we get a lot of creators who want to be like, this is the best you know phone case ever, or you know that really doesn't tell anything. Uh, about what you're doing to the prospective backers. You really want to find a way that you actually communicate um, some of the core benefits or some of the core features of this thing that you're bringing to life. And um, so that's, you know, really, you know, some of the things to think about there. And, and the one thing I recommend is when you're developing your project title and short blurb, you should write, you know, 20 or 40 of options and then select the best one because you'll never know if, you know, the, the, you might get inspired at first, but you'll never know if that first inspiration is really the, the, the best short blurb you can write until you've written, you know, 30 other options. Yeah. Uh, I also would recommend actually put the name of what you're doing into both the blurb and the project title. Uh, this will help you a lot when it comes to searchability. And, you know, I mean, and, and cause sometimes if it's a little too generic, like the world's best clock, <laughs> There's a lot of things that uh, will show up as best in clock and world. So make sure that your name is in there, or your project name, that is. So let's talk a little bit about the project video. Uh, you know, we usually show um, a short video here to, to kind of um, just capture the essence, the, the, the kind of the core elements of a, of a Kickstarter video. But I think in light of our technical difficulties, we'll just talk about uh, what those elements are. And, um, and there are, you know, you know, a Kickstarter video really becomes, it's, it's the main way that you're going to tell your story. Um, and, and at least the essence, the, like distilling the essence of your story. There's, of course, some details that you, you just won't have enough time. But the first thing to keep in mind is that people, you know, won't spend a lot of time on your video. So mm -hmm. to begin with, you should keep your video short. Um, I usually recommend a minute and a half, two minutes at most. At most, yeah. Um, but even within that minute and a half and two minutes, you want to get to what you're doing fast. You don't want to have a one minute lead in before you tell people what it is that you're creating because people just won't wait. Yeah. And, um, and so you should find a way to show what you're doing in the first, you know, ideally 15 seconds, definitely within the first 30 seconds. Yeah. And uh, one tip I have for that, the one mistake I see that a lot of people do with their video is they start listing all the rewards in their video. That's uh, that's a huge like you have your whole project description to do that. You actually have your rewards section to do that. So make the most of that precious precious moments in that video, and don't you don't need to do that. Yeah, and and, and like a few things you know um, that I usually recommend working with tech and design creators. I say that you know you have in the first thirty seconds you should get across what you're doing and what's the core value proposition. You know what is the core thing that differentiates your product from other products um, out there, you know, and from other things out in, in the world. Uh, then once you've kind of gotten that across, you want to actually dive into a little bit of the user experience because it's one thing to say, like, this is my promise. It's another thing to actually bring that to life and actually show that, um, you know, showing something in action, showing the user experience of a product is very different than talking about it, you yeah. know? And I, and I think it's, it, it's a way to, uh, you know, you always have to keep in mind that, you know, on Kickstarter, people don't have that opportunity to go into a store and try your product. They, they don't hear about your product from their friends who have already tried it. So whatever you can do to bring to life the way that this product will fit into the, the lives of your uh, backers, that is a really powerful way for you to engage people in what you're doing and for you to get them excited about it. So again, you, you show your value proposition and talk about your value proposition in the first 30 seconds, then actually, you know, show the user experience, bring that to life by showing your product in action. Once that's done, what you also want to do, which is a core part of Kickstarter videos is actually make sure that you introduce a team. You talk a little bit about your journey. Um, remember that, you know, Kickstarter is not a place where people are just coming to, to buy products or buy food. 
they're actually coming to support somebody that's trying to create a new product or trying to create a new you know, type of food. And so you really want to um, include that story of yours and like introduce yourselves, talk about you know, your journey and, and, or, or it could be your journey, it could be your passion, it could be you know, the sustainable way that you're planning to produce what it is that you're trying to produce. Um, so the last element that I, that I always like to tell creators to put into their videos is the ask. You want to make sure that people understand that their contribution matters. You know, this is not just a video like, hey, look at this wonderful thing I'm doing and everything's great. It's, hey, look at this wonderful thing I'm doing. I want you to be part of this. Your contribution matters. Um, Terry, do you have anything else to add? Um, yeah, just really, it's all about asking people to join you. Instead of thinking I have to ask for like help, yeah. And I think that's one thing a lot of people get really nervous when it comes to creating something like a Kickstarter project. Ask them to be part of what you're doing. Also, um, with that video, shareability. Uh, one of the things you really, uh, the video should feel like a really cool movie trailer. I mean, I'll, I'll take cool out of that. How about compelling, <laughs> compelling movie trailer? Okay, don't feel the pressure. Feel just like something has to just be interesting. This has to just tease me enough to make me think, what is happening here? And I need to, I need to tell someone about this. So the more shareable your videos, you know, the more likely that like, you know, you, if you think it's shareable, if your friends think they want to send it to their coworkers, their, their friends, their parents, whoever, like the more your story is going to get out there. Okay, we're going to go on. I think there's, I think both me and Terry could talk about video a lot more just because that's something that we know that. I'll we'll probably have some questions. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> so, so the next thing that we want to talk about is the product description. And the product description really is where you, you dive deeper into your project. Again, the video, you, you don't have much time. So you, you distill some of these core elements of your project. You ask for support. But this is where you kind of can go deeper into all those different elements of your project. You can actually explore a little bit more about the team, about the experience you bring to the table, possibly about the manufacturing process you plan to use, or the prototypes that you've developed on your, on your journey uh, to where you are now. And, you know, from a... Um, product uh, design and, and technology perspective, you know, prototypes really do matter and they matter for two core reasons. Um, first off, because the user experience matters and until you have a, a prototype that can bring that user experience to life in a way that's compelling, it's really tough to, to, to make your project feel uh, very compelling and to give your backers confidence that they know what they're going to get and that they, they, you know, that they feel like they understand what the actual product will be. Um, so, you know, this product project here that I have as an example was was a uh, Bluetooth speaker that came out about a year and a half ago. And one of the things that these guys did really well is that they, you know, did a bunch of different ways to, to bring the user experience to life, to bring product features to life. They actually used a lot of secondary videos where some secondary videos were showing how the product was waterproof by actually submerging the project, the product in water. Uh, other ones were actually, you know, where they told you about the sound quality of the product, they actually had some, you know, they shared the speaker with some um, sound engineers and had those sound engineers talk about, you know, the sound from the speaker. Um, they would get, you know, along the project, they would actually get samples from the factory and they would do like these um, box opening videos where they would sh like take out the sample from the factory and talk about what was good with the sample and what things still needed to be worked on. So again, they just did a really amazing job at, at you know, bringing the user experience to life, uh, finding ways to, to add credibility to the sound quality that they were promising to their creators, and just letting creators into this process of developing a product and bringing it to life. Um, which is actually the next point that I, that I wanted to bring up, which is this notion of you know, the design process and the creative process in general is really something that's engaging for a lot of people. I mean, uh, I'll be honest, not every backer will care about your creative process, but enough of them will that it's really like, valuable for you to celebrate it. I mean, that's, that is one of the core values of, of, of Kickstarter is that you know, you're not just buying a, a product, but you're actually getting to support somebody and you're getting a glimpse into that creative process. Um, and prototypes is a great way to let people you know, enter into that, into that process. Yeah. Um, so with food, there is a similar way to think about this too. There's no uh, hard rules uh, for food or crafts regarding having a prototype, but this is the opportunity to show people your story. What you know, like if you started out making your, um, you know, your beef jerky in your kitchen, uh, you know, what inspired you? What kind of uh, ingredients inspired you? What kind of uh, adventures in your life uh, just made you decide you needed to really create? 
a product like this? Or if you're opening like a bakery, you know, like what is, uh, why, why is your, your vision of what your kind of bakery, how is that going to be? How is that going to be different from any other bakery out there? Like, why are you doing this? So again, ownership. And it's kind of funny in the beginning, I used to see so many food projects without food in them, <laughs> but people forgot to show their beautiful food. And there's such a culture now online of beautiful food photography, you know, like Instagram, Pinterest, and uh, like so many bloggers that you really need to step up your game when it comes to showing your great food. And there's a lot of, a lot of resources out there about how to take great food photos. So again, own that as well. Show people what you make. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about project rewards. And, you know, project rewards, we tend to classify them into four different categories. So what we'll do is, is just dive into a few different projects and talk about, you know, these different types of rewards and how they might be rewards that you could use, you know, for your own efforts. So the first type of rewards that we see um, often are acknowledgments. And, you know, this is a, this is a project that uses acknowledgments very successful. So successfully, it's a project called Neo Lucida, and they were reinventing an optical drawing tool from the 19th century, and they were creating it for their 21st century art students. These were, you know, uh, Golan Lev and, and uh, Pablo Garcia, which are two art students who, who one of them is at CMU and the other one is uh, in Chicago. And one of the things that they did is that um, they created a very low tier acknowledgement reward um, that the whole point of that reward was to get people to back their project and to share their project. They realized that not everybody is interested in learning how to draw and that they, 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 they thought that they were gonna get a lot of interest from people who just thought what they're doing was cool, was cool but, but wouldn't want to get the actual device. So, um, you know, they had this reward where it was literally, uh, you know, an acknowledgement on their website and, and, um, and it was for a few dollars and that, you know, that reward, which, you know, about 13% of their backers selected was wildly successful and it was one of the reasons why they were able to get so much traction for their project on social media. Acknowledgement rewards don't always have to be such a low hanging, um, you know, a low value reward. I mean, we've seen creators actually have acknowledgement rewards that are much higher value, which, which includes sometimes like, you know, the, they'll put a plaque with that person's name you know, at an event, or they'll put a plaque with that person's name in a physical space, perhaps even in a wall of an office or in a wall mm -hmm. of a community center or whatever that. Or a restaurant. Do. Yeah, they'll or a restaurant. They'll have a beautiful wall hand-painted, uh, you know, or printed in some way. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. They'll, they'll put somebody's name in the, in the, you know, in the box of their product or things like that. So again, you, you can get, I mean, I think acknowledgement rewards are pretty straightforward, but you can get creative, and even though most of these acknowledgement rewards are pretty low value, it is possible to create higher value versions of these rewards as well. So the next type of reward is what we call mementos. And mementos, it, it's usually, you know, some physical uh, token of your participation with a, with a project, but it's not the thing itself that's being created. I mean, a bad memento reward often ends up being t-shirts and things like that, um, that, you know, most people don't really care about, but there is a world of like, creating really good, relevant memento um, rewards. Yeah, I mean, unless you are a band, and you, you, <laughs> you need to make merch anyway. Uh, like, definitely keep your mementos uh, in line with what your actual project is. And this is a very nice one that I really like, that I see with a lot of brewers of both beer and kombucha, is like the growler, the printed growler that has the branding is something that every, every kind of like brewery does. And doing that and offering that to your backers is something you're doing anyway and something that really would carry your brand forward, something they love. Um, they're going to come back and they're going to come back to your, uh, your brewery, uh, you know, your kombucha brewery or your beer brewery uh, time and time again with that growler to fill it up. Yeah, and one good memento also example from, from an SOV Ventures uh, company is uh, a project called Volterra that launched, you know, very early this year. It's a beautiful, um, you know, fabrication tool that lets you, you know, print and uh, print circuit boards, and not, but also it helps um, you actually, um, it, it, it also places solder and, and does all these things to help you develop, you know, rapid prototypes of whatever product you want to create. And their Memento reward was this really nice ruler that had all these different tools for engineers who are developing, you know, circuit boards. So it was... You know, again, it, it was a, a small device. I think they, they were offered it for, you know, 40 or $50. But 
but it was just an extremely useful device for anybody uh, in the community that, that you know, wanted a Volterra. And of course, the Volterra was a really expensive machine. I think it was $1,500. And this allowed people who are engineers, who are really interested in, in, in that type of work, but who might not be at that point in their career able to afford a full Volterra, they could back the project, support it, and get a memento that would be really useful for them. So that's another great example that I often use um, talking about mementos. So the next type of reward is the thing itself. And you know these are, I think, the most simple rewards because it's really just the thing that you're creating. So if you're creating, um, you know, like the print um, camera ca um, camera case that I phone case that I uh, brought up earlier as an example, the, offering that as a reward is you know the the reward. I mean, I think nowadays where we have several SOV uh, SOSV Ventures projects live, um, you know, we have uh, Revo, we have uh, Living um, Farms. I mean, all those products are offering the thing itself as their core reward. I and mean, when you're developing a product, the thing itself will be your core reward. And it is, you know, in order to cross the finish line, chances are, you know, that is the reward that will make the biggest dent in your ability to, to reach your funding goal. So, um, you know, and again, I think this one is pretty simple. I think the main variation we see for the thing itself is the quantity, you know, like yeah. people might offer sets of that reward, you know, you might be able to get, you know, using the Revolts as an example, you could get a couple set of the Revolts where you get a headphone for you, a earphone for you and a earphone for your partner. Right. And for crowdsource, it made sense. Uh, you know, there is definitely the, the one for someone that just wants to try it out, but then there's the hardcore home fermenter yeah. that, uh, <laughs> that can't wait to make stars of kimchi all at once. So definitely think about your quantities. And the last, you know, type of, of reward that we see often um, is experiential rewards. And, and these rewards are really, you know, are, are in some ways the most fun and, and one where you can get the most creative with them. Um, these involve actual experiences um, that you can share with your backers. You know, I think this is a, a great example here that, that, you know, Terry picked out. Yeah, I love this one. This is a museum of drink in New York City. And this is their first project they did with us. They, they found an ancient cereal puffing gun. And they rebuilt it, and they basically took it on the road. And you could go visit. It was at Maker Faire a couple of years ago. And this was a crazy reward. These rewards tend to be higher priced, and you should absolutely price them higher because they are very special and exclusive. But there are people out there that are going to want that. And for this example, they would bring uh, the puffing gun to you. It would be really fun. You'd have a night of exploding cereal. Um, so, yeah, so think about these are the ones you should really think about. You're really going to connect probably – Face to face on a very personal level with uh, with uh, your most enthusiastic backers, and I think you know, I think for for you know food, you know I think that that you know food experiences are, are, are maybe a little more more common than, than experiential rewards on uh, on tech and design projects. But we have seen really amazing tech and design rewards. I mean, uh, you know, for for you know just using you know fab fabrication tool type projects again as an example, we've definitely seen projects that have coupled you know, learning uh, opportunities uh, with, you know, their fabrication device. So it's like you get to actually, you know, the, the, uh, the creator of the device will give you a hands-on tutorial on how to use that fabrication device. So it's not to say that, again, we're not trying to say that you should have all these rewards in your project. You really have to figure out which ones make sense. So this is not yeah. um, say that you should always have one of each of these types of reward. That's really not it. It's more just to help you guys see the different types of rewards that are that are um, commonly used. I mean, I do recommend creators sometimes to try to brainstorm around all these four buckets, but then, you know, they might only have, you know, rewards from one or two of these buckets that actually show up on their project at the end, you know, and that's, that's fine. You really have to, you know, see what's most relevant for you. Um, the question that we often get asked is like, what are the most common selected pledges on Kickstarter? And across the board, $25 is the most common pledge on Kickstarter. But it's not the most uh, the one that generates the most money. A hundred dollars is the pledge that generates the most money, um, and the ideal number of reward tiers. And again, uh, the other two bullet points, the hundred dollars and twenty-five dollars, that those are numbers based on data that we pulled. Uh, in terms of the ideal number of reward tiers, that's more kind of our anecdotal advice based on working with many creators. Is that usually you don't want to start off your project with too many rewards, and and the reason being is you can always add rewards, but you can't re like remove rewards from your project once somebody has selected that reward. Um, and the fact is, your backers will let you know if there's a reward that they want and you're not offering, you will hear about that, mm -hmm. you know. And and so 
Um, you want to, like, I always recommend to creators, you know, five to seven rewards to start with, and then know that you're going to end up adding, you know, somewhere between two to five more rewards while the product is live. Um, and of course, you know, there are times where some products do require more rewards than that. That's okay to break this rule, but I think it's the, the notion is you want to, you know, the more rewards you add, also sometimes it makes it harder for people to choose. It doesn't necessarily make it easier. Yeah, and, and you're going to have plenty to do once yes. your project is funded. Mm -hmm. You're going to have plenty to do. Don't worry. Like, like, even if you think only three rewards, yeah, you'll, you'll have enough on your, on your mind and to take care of. So. Yeah, because the more rewards yeah. you offer, the, hard, the more work is required from the perspective of fulfillment. So something to keep in mind. So um, next up, we want to talk about product updates. And product updates is the way that you keep your backers engaged throughout the entire process. Uh, product updates actually get delivered as emails to your backers' inbox. So this is a way that you proactively you know, uh, re-engage people into your project once they've backed, uh, which is a really powerful thing. Um, you know, what we see is when a product is live, you know, creators will send product updates more often, and, and that frequency can be every, you know, three, four days to every week to once a week. But it is really important that you do, you know, uh, update your backers on a regular basis while your project is live because that keeps your projects top of mind, and that increases the chances that your project will get shared. Um, and, you know, product updates are a great way for you to, you know, dive deeper into parts of your story. You could dive deeper, like if you're continuing to work on, the, on developing your product, you might actually have updates about the product while, you know, the campaign is still live. But you can also use this as a way to celebrate things. So, you know, this example here was, you know, a creator saying like, hey, we're halfway there, you know, in 24 hours. Which is uh, wonderful news. Yeah. 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 So use it as a way to celebrate, you know, good things and um, and just, um, you know, I, I we do recommend that before you launch, you do brainstorm a little bit what are, you know, topics that you might want to do for updates, only because once your product is live, sometimes you get buried in, like, answering comments, answering emails, um, out to press. And so by having some done some work beforehand on your product updates, that will mean even if you start getting swamped when your project is live, which is very likely because it is a lot of work to manage a live project, you'll still will be able to send project updates on a regular basis. Otherwise, what might happen is that you end up sending no updates, or the updates that you send are very, you know, are very con lacking content and and don't are not very compelling. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's again, it's it's a little bit if you have any experience with blogging or um, you know, even if you do just, just any kind of bare, bare bone social media, this is an experiment in um, pre-planning a little bit, um, think of some stock updates in some ways, like talking about your process, uh, your background a little more, stuff you wanted to talk about in your video, but you realize you didn't have enough time to do that. You could even do a video update easily. You can do, um, you know, like just images. Like there's a lot of ways you can very, be very creative with an update and make it a lot of fun. And, and then, you know, once a product has wrapped up, usually the updates become a little less frequent, but they're not any less important. Um, once your product has wrapped, your updates become your way to continue to manage the expectations of the backers in your community and to continue to keep them updated about your progress. You know, it's, I think, backers, you know, they, they will have a lot more confidence in you and they will be a lot more um, understanding of things that happen if you keep them updated throughout that process. Um, I often recommend for creators to pick uh, a frequency of updates and let their backers know, hey, I'm going to be sending you updates every three weeks, mm -hmm. and then really be good about sending updates every three weeks so that backers are not like, oh, my God, I haven't heard from him for five weeks now, so <laughs> what's going on? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And this update I, I like a lot because the creator of the Crutcher's Jar, she was having some, some design issues that we're going to delay the project a little. So if you ever face that kind of thing, don't hesitate to make an update. It's yeah. better, you're much better off being honest and straightforward with your backers than being silent. Yeah. And, and, on, and I've learned a lot of great stuff from creators about like, you know, shipping delays, about like strikes going on on the West Coast, uh, you know, things that, that will delay or somehow get in the way of, of delivery, so. Chinese New Year, for example. Exactly. <laughs> and there's so many things like, so use this as an opportunity to talk to your backers. You'll find the overwhelming uh, amount of them will be incredibly supportive yeah. and will appreciate that you let them know. Yeah. 
And um, so that's it about updates. So we just have, you know, uh, we're, we're just about to wrap up. We just wanted to talk a little bit about community. And uh, because, you know, building a community is something really important, but it isn't something that just happens once you launch your Kickstarter campaign. As a matter of fact, that's something in an ideal world, you should be thinking about, you know, months in advance, um, you know, and of course, you know, for some projects, they, they might, you might be developing a technology that is very secretive. So you, you do have to keep things under wraps. But in general, that's not the case. And so uh, we just wanted to share some thoughts and tips on, on, you know, how to think about community and how to start, you know, building that, you know, early on. So, so the first slide here, we just, you know, you know, when you're trying to build community, you know, you do have to look at, you know, all the different areas or places where you might find people that, that are potentially supporters of what you're doing. And of course, the, the first level of that is friends and family, you know, and, um, you know, that's, that's kind of your first stop in terms of, you know, that's usually your first sounding board, that's usually, and, and that is the first place you'll probably think about and the first people you'll talk about your project and start engaging in this thing that you're creating. But beyond that, you know, there's of course, you know, professional organizations, social, social organizations, you know, your extended personal network, um, you know, that you can reach out, uh, you know, through Facebook. And, and I think in the world of Facebook, LinkedIn, you have, you know, both your, your kind of your uh, first degree network, and then you can even often reach out to your second or third degree network through some of these sites. Um, you know, there's other, you know, networks of, of con contributors or collaborators that you've worked with in the past. And then there's, of course, you know, the media, you know, blogs and, you know, also just people that you can reach out to through forums, you know, of shared interest. Um, it, and it really is, you know, you, you do really want to map out this entire yeah. uh, world and, and, and understand, like, what, what are the places that, that you want to spend most of your effort on? And, and one thing I tell a lot of creators is this is something you could do right now. You know, maybe you're, you're still, like, months away from, like, really developing a prototype or you haven't found a location yet for your restaurant, or you know, you're still working on your recipes, uh, whatever all that is, if you have the concept and you, you know yourself and your story and why you're doing this, you can start thinking about all of these people now and start working on these, uh, these partnerships and these, uh, these connections now. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, uh, the, like start early, you know, just reiterating, you know, and I think one of the things to consider, I think, you know, like one of the things that you're trying to do is often build relationships with these people. I mean, even people in the press and bloggers, if you are building a company, you're, you know, you, you, and, and, and what your company works on is covered by these bloggers or is, is related, is in the area of interest for, you know, any social organizations, like look at it as building a long-term relationship that can, you know, not only help you in this one project, this one funding campaign, but that can hopefully help you you know, as your business continues to grow, you know, two years, five years, 10 years out. So it really is, yeah. it's an investment that's worth doing and it's an investment that's, that is worth the time and effort required. Yeah, and I mean, one thing I often tell creators also is the money you're gonna raise is gonna help you right now, but like, you know, that will, that has a finite <laughs> use, right? That the money will go quickly, it always does. Mm -hmm. But the connections that you're gonna make before, during, and after your campaign can go on for years and maybe you know beyond. Like, yeah, yeah. So this is stuff you need to do anyway. And then I think one of the, the ways you know, like that you're going to be able to do that is by sharing. You know, I think I mean that's the one thing. Like sharing what you're doing, sharing your passion for what you're doing, um, finding ways to share that and avenues for sharing that is really important. And you know that can be real world events. Uh, you know, real world events. You, you might limit who you can touch, but you can touch people in a much deeper sense, you know, often when you actually meet face to face and, you know, um, like actually show your product or show your prototype um, and, and have those conversations and perhaps even a beer, you know, in, in a face to face, um, you know, content. But beyond that, you know, like, you know, sharing, you know, like on online sharing, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, like, um, whatever, whatever uh, environment makes sense, you know, that's, that's really important. And, and also, you know, as you're, as you're sharing, you know, like think about like building, you know, your, your social media presence, think about, uh, you know, collecting email addresses, think about what are those, those things that you can do so that, you know, six months down the road, two months down the road, you know, you, you kind of, you connect it with some people who, you know, are interested in what you're doing and you have a way to reach out to them again and re-engage them in this, 
you know, process. Yeah, and definitely on the, a note on social media, many times I meet creators who really dread social media. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the news is you really have to learn to love some aspect of it. And find the social media that connects with your community. You know, with food, I gotta tell you, Instagram is probably like one of the number one things you gotta do. But you know, if you're a comics, probably something like Twitter. You know, or like with product design, probably like also. Um, what do you say? Like I mean, in, I think I think interest I, or no Twitter, Twitter. Twitter can help, but also Twitter, yeah. Facebook can be really powerful. It is. But I think I think to Terry's point, you don't feel like you have to be in every social media. It's finding out what is the right one for you that lets you connect with your community. It's, it's better to to like be on less, but be on the ones that matter and and and, and have the right focus on yeah. those. Yeah, it's probably the one you like to use. That's yeah. a hint. <laughs> <laughs> And so that is pretty much it. I mean, now I think yeah. we'll just turn it over to the Q and A. So I'm gonna unshare a screen, and so you can see us and and you know submit your questions. Cool. Well, first, thank you both so much. That's awesome. Um, it's really cool to hear kind of from the horse's mouth, so to speak, uh, what you need to do, what you need to be thinking of. So um, for folks watching at home, I'll just invite you again to use the Q and A app um, in Google Hangouts to submit your questions. I have tons of questions for you guys anyway, so I might just launch into some wow. of those. Um, but, but it's really terrific. So thanks. Um, I think one thing I'm really curious about, curious about is, you know, timing. How do you know, and maybe you guys can draw on some examples or experiences from, um, your own work with Kickstarter teams. How do you know when you're ready for a Kickstarter campaign, when you're ready to put that together or really maybe the alternative, uh, how do you, what are some signs that you're still not ready, um, to put together your campaign or to launch your campaign? Great. I mean, I think I think from the design and tech angle, um, I always tell creators: if your prototype, if can't actually, if you can't uh, deliver a compelling user experience with your current prototype, um, you know, and, and like then you're not ready. And I, I want to be clear about that. That doesn't mean that your prototype has to work every detail. Like you may, like let's say, your prototype may need to do X, Y, and Z. But X is the actual core, you know, of what you're offering. You know, like the Y and Z are additional little features that are nice to have. Like then you just need to be able to, to like your prototype should be able to show X and, mm -hmm. and bring that to life. So that if, 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 for example, a backer would come to your, you know, to your offices and they actually got to see the prototype, that they would be able to experience what you're creating in a compelling way. Um, that's what I say is kind of like the core requirement, and then and then of course you need to be able to to show that in the context of a Kickstarter campaign, which be which would mean you have to show that in a video uh, in a way that's compelling. But but that's really you know, and the part of the reason why is twofold. One, if you don't have that, you're not able to to show what you're bringing to life in a way that's compelling, or you're gonna have you're gonna struggle. But in another way, you just haven't figured out, out enough of the problem that you're solving. You probably, at that point, are not ready to really understand the costs that are gonna, you're going to incur to bring that to life. Mm -hmm. um, and you're probably, again, you, then, then at that point, you're, you're raising money not just to manufacture what you're doing, but also for a lot of product development. Um, and so unless you have somehow the funding to, to deal with that product development, you're also putting yourself in a tough position where you might even succeed on Kickstarter, but then you could possibly fail in your larger, you know, effort, which, you know, for us, it's always important that, you know, you look at Kickstarter in a way that can really be supportive of your long-term effort. Like we don't want, we've seen creators that have succeeded on Kickstarter, delivered a product, but then like this, mm -hmm. like had to fold after they delivered the product because, you know, they, they just didn't, um, uh, run the, the, the project in a way that helped them set them up for long-term success. It just helped them, you know, create a small batch of this thing that they were doing. So, right. Yeah. It's, food is, it's very diverse, the category, but like in the instance of a food product, you're making a product, we talked about some food products. It's, it's very similar. Uh, instead of a prototype per se, it's like you can actually not only make the thing, you've been probably making it on some, some scale already, like you've probably been doing like in a small commercial kitchen or in your home, uh, and let's say your project is about getting to the next level of manufacturing. It could be you're ready to, to engage with your first co-packer, and you want to do like you know a unit run of 5,000, or you just got an order from a distributor, and you're like, okay, this is it. I'm ready to go ahead and take jump to the next level of manufacturing. So, I mean, there's that level that you need to be prepared for that. Shipping, 
do you have any experience with shipping? I often tell like a lot of my creators that I meet have never shipped any their product really, or they've only done it on a tiny scale. This is where I say this is where you need to start learning how to ship things. You know, if you're if you're not going to have a co-packer take care of it for you, if you're doing it all by hand, this is when you send out. You've already done your homework and you've learned like what happens when you ship something to Los Angeles, Chicago, Toronto, wherever you're going to go. You know, so there's that level. Uh, do you have the packaging set? Uh, if you've never put your hot sauce in a glass bottle before and you've never shipped it anywhere, you're probably not quite ready. You need to go ahead and make sure and see what happens if we mail a, a box of hot sauce to someone. Do they do they get the bottles broken? Do they survive that? There's a lot of like field work I want you to do before that. So when it comes time, when you wrap up your project and now you have to send out 300 bot 300 orders, that you're going to be ready for that. So yeah, and usually there's the visual component as well. You already know your story. You can already pitch and say, hey, this is a hot sauce. Why is it? Because it's barrel aged and you know whiskey barrels and you know with hand harvested forage peppers whatever the story is you know like you got the story you have the beautiful photos uh because you've already learned how to do that that level of marketing yeah. so yeah it's usually that next stage you've been doing this for a little while on some scale and you're ready to take that next that next step and i do i do think a lot of things that terry said about you know understanding packaging uh shipping um, those are things that, you know, like I think that research, you know, I was focused more on like the product development of it, but mm -hmm. that uh, still work of like, um, you know, understanding even like how you're going to do it so that you can, again, understand the costs. I mean, I think that's a, a core thing, like understanding the costs because there's some level of variability in the cost that, that you know, you're not going to be able to nail it down to the like, like minute detail, but you really need to have like an understanding of the general cost of, of like what it will it cost to design and, and print the packaging? What will it cost to actually ship that? Where, like, where are you willing to ship that? So like doing all that homework beyond the product is also, you know, really, uh, really core because beyond the, 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 the cogs, you know, there is all these other things that you're also going to have to cover. Yeah. With your cool. Cool. Thanks. We have a question here too from Alan uh, asking, what's the ideal length of time for a campaign? 60 days, um, maybe are there specific times of year you should avoid like Christmas or I don't know, uh, 4th of July. What are, what, how, how do you figure out the timing question and the length? That's, that's a really, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the length question, that I, at least in the tech and design category, that's something that's, that's been changing. I think, I mean, historically, one of the things we do say that at least you should, your product should be at least around 30 days because we do see that in general, your chances of success are lower if your campaign is less than 30 days. Mm -hmm. Of course, creator, we've seen creators do campaigns that are less than 30 days that have been very successful. But statistically speaking, looking at all projects on Kickstarter, uh, there, your chances of success is lower if you, if you run a shorter campaign. What we've seen in the tech and design space though is that more and more creators have been doing longer campaigns. And one of the reasons that we've seen that happening is because creators are using digital marketing tools more often. And what that enables creators to do is that the standard curve for most Kickstarter projects in the tech and design space is you have a very steep curve at the beginning. So you're, you know, like you have a lot of momentum in the first few days of the campaign, then it slows down after a week. It's, it's, it's you know, in the past, after a week, it was almost flat. The curve would be like very going up very so you'd be, you know, like let's say you raise a hundred thousand dollars in your first week. After that first week, you might be like raising just like two to five thousand dollars a day, you know, so very little money for the rest of the campaign. And then towards the end, you would get another little bump. What digital marketing has allowed some creators to do, not all, but some creators are able to keep that middle part of the curve a little bit steeper. So whereas before there was very little value extending your project from 30 to 60 days, when you use digital marketing effectively and if you're able to get traction from digital marketing, extending your campaign by 30 days can actually mean a substantial amount of more money for you. But I do want to point out that you know, this kind of traction with digital marketing is not something that all campaigns are able to pull off. Um, so some other creators will end up having to manage their campaign for 60 days for very little, uh, you know, return on their on the time and effort of managing the campaign for those additional 
30 days. But that's that's a, a kind of what I've seen from a campaign length. What, what's, what's yeah, I, I mean, I would say that's, I, I also have like similar sentiments on that. In general, I tell, unless you really have a very uh, aggressive plan <laughs> about what you're gonna do, like you, you found the right digital marketer or some kind of marketing, you know, like company that you really trust and you feel are gonna do the work for you because, you know, there's a lot of uh, trial and error out there. Um, doing a very long campaign can be very draining. Mm -hmm. It can uh, exhaust you. It can be very like emotionally, uh, you know, like pull you in all kinds Maybe of directions. Sure. Yeah, it is. It is like if you wanted to do a very long campaign, one reason I could see maybe if there were specific events that you knew that you needed to be at to go ahead and be present at and live and talk to your engage your audience with, and let's say they were like a week and a half apart, you know, probably it's worth extending your campaign. Maybe opportunities will pop up in between media that you didn't realize or support from other places. So uh, in general, like that, that's why we stress so much planning in advance and planning early, because the more you plan out, the more you're going to have to fall back on when things don't turn out quite how you expected during a live campaign, which happens all the time. Um, I'll say something about the short campaign though. I've definitely seen <laughs> if you have a very type A personality and you're very driven and you're very much like, I have a plan for every moment of the day when this campaign is live. I've seen campaigns like totally just go straight up like this in a 25, 20 day period. That is for a special kind of person. <laughs> a special kind of person. And I've seen very like very motivated people pull off really great stuff in a very short amount of time. So there's something to be said for that. But but I think 30 to 35 is a pretty comfortable place yeah. for most people. And in terms of time of year uh, that you were asking seasonality, I think the first thing that I tell creators is um, the first answer to that question is does your project have a seasonality associated to it. Like if you have a project uh, that, I mean, you know, the second biggest project ever, the coolest cooler, it's a project that's, people are thinking about coolers in the summer. So that's a product where, they, where that product was run for two months in July and August. And that's a product that makes sense to run it in the summer. It's a product, I mean, the first version of that project, which was unsuccessful, was run the winter the year beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not the only reason why it didn't succeed. I mean, the product itself was less compelling, but that is a core reason. You know, like people don't want to buy coolers when they're freezing their ass off. Uh, in the summer, when they're thinking about going to the beach, then they're thinking about coolers. So that's the first thing. Beyond that, I mean, the activity on Kickstarter does tend to go down a little bit in uh, August and towards the end of the year, you know, like December through early January. So, but the success rate of projects, if you look at the success rate, it doesn't change. Um, so what that says is that, you know, uh, most likely the, the number of backers and projects that are live on Kickstarter kind of go down in those months, but we don't really see, it's not like your product is less likely to succeed. I do recommend for creators to avoid launching their projects right around the holidays because again, as I mentioned earlier, the curve on the beginning of a project tends to be really important those, right. those yeah. first days. We, so in general, like if, I don't recommend you launch right near Thanksgiving or right, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, but I know that Terry has an example of a creator I that do. launched in Thanksgiving and did really well. Because they did their homework. They really planned out and they knew their community very well. They insisted on launching midnight uh, Black Friday, like, uh, yeah, there's like right in Black Friday. They wanted right. to do that. And uh, I woke up that morning and they had already reached half their goal. Wow. But that's because they knew their backers were going to be online. So basically what we, the, the ground rule about this, we, oh, Sears All. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great project by Booker and Dax. It's, a, it's like a small blowtorch for your kitchen. Um, so, so yeah, um, it's pretty cool. So yeah, basically think about when are your backers going to be online and when are they going to want to share or just pledge right then and there? You know, like we see a lot of traction in the weekday, like, you know, like in the mornings. Um, but in general, like I would also recommend for that to get that really awesome, you know, that, that boost in the beginning is to plan some kind of event in some way. And it can be a virtual event too, something to gather those people you really trust and love who are going to back your project right away. If you get a good, healthy start, yeah. It's just going to make your project just look all around, just do better and, and succeed a lot more. And, and I mean, you mentioned a little bit of the day of the week. I mean, well, yeah. on a weekly uh, basis, we do see the activity on the site. It kind of goes up uh, and it peaks in the middle of the week on Wednesday, and then it comes down again. So that is the reason why we see so many projects launching between Monday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that they're trying to launch when the 
you know, activities going up so that, the acti so that they're live, you know, maybe for their second day is on a Wednesday or something like that. That's, that is why we see that uh, being a trend. Uh, there isn't, we don't have any data though to say that like if you launch on Monday or Tuesday, your product is any more likely to succeed. Yeah. That's just, you know, people trying to, um, you know, align their launch with a day of the week where the, you know, um, traffic on Kickstarter and activity on Kickstarter is going up. So mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And actually related to that, we have a question in from Brian asking about trends uh, in relation to the funding of projects. So the question is like, you know, for example, is say 75% of funding pledged in the first 10 or 15 days of a campaign going live? Um, or maybe, you know, what's, what does that timeline often look like in terms of maybe peaks and valleys? And then kind of a follow up to that being, uh, if the campaign is getting off to a slow start, then what are some tactics you've seen that have worked to kind of change the course of things? Yeah, um, I mean, I think like I, there is definitely, I think this wrong notion out there that like, oh, you have to get, you know, uh, most like almost all the way there in the first few days or in the first week. I mean, 70% of campaigns um, in tech and design, I mean, this is not a general number for the whole site, but I know that a little bit more than 70% of campaigns don't fund in the first, you know, uh, seven or eight days. Mm -hmm. So, like, most campaigns are actually, you know, uh, working to get funded all the way through the end, through the last few days. I mean, most products on Kickstarter um, only fund in the last few days, and most products on Kickstarter fund somewhere between 100 or, or 100 and 130%. So that is kind of like the majority of projects. And I think, you know, what happens is most creators will hear the stories of the pebbles and the prints and the cocoons, and they'll be like, you know, because of course, yeah, I can understand that most startups, that's their dream is to reach that level of success. Okay. And those, you know, um, you know, getting, you know, freaking out, you know, because like, oh my God. Um, and I think that that is one of the things to consider is like most projects on Kickstarter are, you know, will, if you're funded, you will just fund or a little bit beyond that. It's not uh, like that. The, those products that fund over a million dollars are the, out, are the outliers. I mean, there's only been like a hundred and, and, and maybe 40 or 50 products that have reached over a million and we've had 94,000 products funded. So when you look at as a percentage, those are very rare. Um, in terms of like what you do if your you know, campaign doesn't take off super strong in the first few days, um, this is one of those situations where it's just a lot of hard work. Like yeah. there isn't, I mean, I think the levers that I talk to creators a lot about is, you know, PR, you know, and, and, and like that's why also the more work you can do there beforehand, exactly. the more relationships, the more you, you'd have leverage to then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like use PR to your advantage once you launch. Digital marketing is something that's becoming more powerful. It's still very secondary to PR, but it's something that we do see some campaigns being able to leverage a little bit more. And then engaging your backup community. And those are your three main levers, like is you know uh, that that we see creators using at whatever point in their campaign to kind of push forward their the um, you know their project. I mean, yeah. Again, like that 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 goes back to plan, 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 plan for the times. You know, the lean times and. And, and the times that are successful too. And, and to that story, like a, most successful projects on the site do have a slight plateau, yeah. a slight slowdown in the middle. So don't panic when that happens because almost always we see due to your hard work and due to just activity on the site and all kinds of things, your project will escalate and, and probably keep you know reaching and, and pushing toward that funding goal through the very, very end. And that's just how these things run a lot of times. But they do succeed. They do succeed. Yeah. It works. And I do think, I mean, if, for, if a creator, for example, this is a situation where they just, for whatever reason, didn't have the time to do the pre-work as far as, you know, PR and, like, you know, try to start reaching out to those people beforehand, um, I mean, then what they should do is end up, they would need to do that work while the product is live. You know, it's like if they had, didn't do that research to identify who are all the people who they would want to connect with, Again, and, and when I'm using PR broadly here, I don't mean just uh, you know blogs and um, and, and uh, like journalists, but also you know forums. You know, like depending on the project, if it's a project that that is more niche, you know, then, it's, then you know that PR work is really more engaging. You know, communities um, that you that are passionate about that thing, and and unfortunately, again, there is no shortcut. Then it would just mean like at that point where the product is live they would need to go through the process of actually 
identifying who are those people that they want to connect with, and then actually reaching out to them um, and doing so. You know, I think the important thing is the probably the top twenty or, or thirty people that they that, that you think are really could help your project. You want to reach out to them in a really tailored manner. You're not sending them like a canned press release. No. You're actually mm -hmm. reaching out to them in a very like like you understand what they care about. Like you mm -hmm. want to make it like you have to position your project in a very specific way to to the interests of that you know person. And that's why you do your homework. Like yeah. research who these journalists are, research who these bloggers are. Like yeah, like treat them like people. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah, common sense in a, in a way. Um, I have kind of another question that has been, um, you know, in thinking about how our programs are structured, certainly if a team's taking part in hacks, um, you know, hacks kind of culminates in a Kickstarter campaign for those teams. So a big part of that program is kind of getting them ready. We, you know, part of taking part in the SOSV experience is that we make that re those resources available in terms of getting your video up to snuff. Not. But for teams that are maybe outside of hacks or um, teams that are kind of coming into it a little bit, maybe post accelerator, if you are kind of running on the really limited budget, um, what are maybe the the tools or resources? We kind of talked about them a little bit. What are what's where do you get the most bang for your buck? Is it is it doubling down on a video? Um, is it investing in maybe earn PR? What for the campaigns that you've seen that have gone you know most viral? Um, if you're on a tight budget, what's the best way to to, to spend that um, that budget? What's the best way to kind of maximize whatever limited resources you have going into a campaign? I mean, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, there isn't a right answer for all projects. I think it does depend a little bit on, on your project, like uh, some projects. And it depends on the talent um, of, of, of the creators as well. I think there are certain, I mean, I think that the, the fact is there are certain, there is certain type of work that does require a lot of legwork, and, and it also then depends on to what extent can the creators themselves, like I've seen creators take on the PR work in a really amazing way, but it just, mm -hmm. it meant that the creator had to devote a substantial amount of time. So, you know, people are asking, do I need to get a PR firm? I'm like, you don't, if, if somebody on your team can, you know, spend the few months before the campaign really researching that and really focusing their efforts and and, and um, you know, so, so for me, you know, like video is one of those things that I think to do a really good video, usually creators do need some help. Like I've seen PR be done effectively by creators who just have time and effort to put into, you know, doing that research, to put into reaching out to those uh, bloggers and journalists in a way that's, that's tailored and, and respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to video, you know, what I've seen is, is even the way to get a low cost video ends up being like if somebody has a friend who's a videographer yeah. who can help out, you know, like, like the fact is like, you don't have to spend tons of money. You don't, you don't have to have something super well produced, but, uh, but it is a, a little bit harder to get up to speed in three months on how to do a really good video than it is to do the research and do PR work. At least that's what I've seen. Um, right. On, yeah. In the design world. I don't know. Pretty much, I feel like it is about your strengths, like, like what limited amount of time, what are you really good at? If you really already love social media and you're on there all the time, like you got that, you know? If you hate it, probably you know somebody, uh, you know, someone with like, you know, an intern or uh, someone's, your kid, <laughs> your tech savvy kid, you know, have them enlist them to help you out. Uh, video is probably the one that we hear the most though, like absolutely, and if you don't feel wrong about that, like you definitely, there's a whole ecosystem now of people that will make a great Kickstarter for video for you. Um, and, yeah. and, I, and I do think, I mean, to that point, I mean, in some ways it does become like being, uh, you know, finding people within your network. Like you might not be able to, if you don't have a lot of money, you may not be able to get the video person who is the real Kickstarter expert who's done a bunch of videos because they might cost ten thousand right. dollars. And you, um, but right. it does become a little bit harder. Like, you know, do you are there any you know art schools nearby mm -hmm. where you might find you know. A student who um, who might be able to help you, uh, and again, those are all. Of course, there's a little bit more risk involved in in, in, in that and going to standard. But but then at the end of the day, like you, it, it's trying to do the best with the resources that you have um, at hand. Um, but but um, but yeah, it, it is it is one of those things though that like what happens also is if you have less resources. Sometimes it, that, that also just means that you might need a little bit more time yeah. to get to your Kickstarter. You know, like if you have a lot of resources you can throw at it, 
you might be able to develop everything in a month and a half and go live. But you know, if you don't, you're probably going to need to like like four months to, to get everything in order. Yeah, and one of the things I see a lot too with my with my food makers is that they have their normal hustle where they are at farmers markets or they have orders to deliver and they neglect their campaign. So this is again how you plan in advance. And if you feel like you're not going to be able to be on top of answering, you know, like messages and doing updates. That's another thing you might want to consider putting that budget, that budget, whatever that little budget is that you have, you know, putting a little side for that. Right. And, and then kind of on the same idea of budget, are there guidelines or frameworks that you, maybe you guys, when you're working with teams have for figuring out what your ask should be? Should it be, you know, super ambitious or should you kind of like keep it to, you know, maybe a little bit less than you actually need? What's the, what's the, is it some kind of Goldilocks question number in between? What are, you know, are there, are there nice guidelines for figuring out um, just how much you actually need first, you know, especially when you're thinking about what you, what you want to do now, of course, like you should probably know how much things cost and, 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 you know, understand a little bit that, that way. But when you're thinking about a strategic amount to ask for, um, what are some factors that might go into that? I mean, in the tech and design world, because again, as I mentioned earlier, most projects that fund, they do only, you know, fund somewhere between 100 to 130 mm percent. -hmm. So that's something I tell creators, like, you know, if you are only get 100, 120 percent funded, are you going to have enough money to bring this to life? Like, you don't, like, I, I strongly push back against the notion of, like, setting a lower goal to be able to blow past the goal or to expect yeah. that, like, there's this notion, like, once I get to the goal, people are going to have more confidence in my project. And, I mean, to be honest, like, I, I haven't seen data that proves that. Like, that's this kind of... Uh, idea that gets thrown out there and I think that's an idea sometimes I hear that from a PR angle where it's like once I reach my goal that gives me another reason to reach out to press um, like again I don't like we always recommend like know what you what you really need and ask for that it's better to ask for you know three hundred thousand dollars and not make it uh, that's like trying to get a round of financing with VCs and not succeeding then to have like uh, to ask for two hundred thousand dollars, and then you have a thousand people who expect you to deliver something that you're not in a place to deliver. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the risk there is much, much. Yeah, one of the things I often tell my creators is that well, this will help you a lot in just figuring out what your project is because a lot of what the creators I work with have an ongoing vision. We want to keep doing this for years to come. So you know they're very on that focus. But one of the ideas with the Kickstarter project is it should be focused. And to help you focus on what aspect do you need to fund of your idea? Do you need to uh, secure a retail location for three months? Do you need to complete one co-packing order? Do you need to develop packaging, you know, and print, you know, a thousand units or ten thousand units? So based on that number, that's something you can build off of, mm -hmm. and that should include shipping, 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 shipping. <laughs> you know, that's why we encourage. Like experiment with shipping. Do all your homework. Find out what it's going to cost to do a a very like like a good reasonable like goal. Not even worldwide shipping. Maybe only shipping within you know like your particular country or North America, especially if it's food, because you have to deal with all kinds of customs and things that unless you're ready to do that, unless you've really thought about that. So based off of like like a finite goal, we need to accomplish this. Rather than we need to create a company that will take over the world, or you know, we want to have like 50 restaurants and all these places. Think about the fresh restaurant. Think about you know, we need to create like like three SKUs of our hot sauce. Like use that to build that number, and and don't go too crazy. And that's why that's will keep you from going too over ambitious as well. You know, everybody wants a million dollars, but you know. <laughs> and one other thing that I would add in the design and tech world is like if you've figured out. If you feel pretty confident that you've figured out how you could deliver, let's say, 2,000 of, of, of units of what you're creating, um, you know who you would work with, you kind of confirm that you, you understand the processes that you would be using to manufacture that scale. Don't assume that if all of a sudden you have to produce 10,000 units, the processes and everything are going to be the same. You're just going to be getting everything for cheaper because it's like economies of scale. Right. Because there's often, you know, gaps in that in that scaling that you might not be aware of like between 5,000 and 10,000 units you might be losing money or you might just be delivering products very late because you have to you know uh, produce them in separate batches or something like that so really understand that because um, 
there's a few things you can do. I mean, you can, you can set people's expectations about the delivery time that the delivery time will be tiered so that you are only going to deliver 2,000 units by, you know, October and you're going to deliver another, you know, 2,000, you know, three months later. Um, or you can just limit that rewards, you know. So I think that's one of the, the risks that – I've seen that happen less often, but we have seen a few creators that, you know, overwhelming success has actually proven to be – uh, to be really difficult because also you're having to provide customer support all of a sudden to 10,000 people that is a shitload of email that you're going to have to answer and if you don't have if you're not ready to deal with that like you could be you know putting the nails in your coffin because mm -hmm. you know everybody's going to be really unhappy with the experience they've had with their brand yeah and it, for food I'm a big fan of subscription style rewards where that's another way to sort of space out your production so instead of having to like roast like 5,000 5, pounds of coffee and deliver that all at once, you could definitely space that out over the next two months, three months, six months, and that's a really great way to do it. Also to experiment with your future business model as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we also have a question in from Steve about um, non-US teams. Is there any way a non-US team can, non-US based team can take part in Kickstarter? What does kind of the international side of Kickstarter look like? I mean, we're open right now uh, to projects uh, in, in many countries beyond the U.S. So, so uh, Canada, the U.K., um, you know, New Zealand, Australia. We're open in most other countries in Europe. I mean, France, Germany, Belgium, uh, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, Sweden. So, like most of Western Europe, we're already open. We even have an in-language experience for creators in, in mm -hmm. Germany, France, and uh, in Spain. Um, so, so we've definitely expanded. Um, right now, you know, we do have eligibility requirements where, you know, to run a campaign, somebody on your team needs to be from one of those countries that we're open in, and they need to, um, you know, be a resident or a permanent resident or a citizen of, of, of that, that country, and you need to have a bank account mm -hmm. um, in that country. You can set up your, your campaign as a legal entity or as an individual, but even if you set up a campaign as a legal entity, you still need to have a human being from that country that's connected to the campaign. So that is one of the things I want to bring up because I do have creators who will set up a company in the U.S. and are like, okay, now I can run a product as a, as a U.S. project. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Like, we do need a human being from that country yeah. to be linked to the project. And do that early. Do that as one of the first things. Get that get that set and not a way because it'll make your life a lot happier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's certainly our teams because they're all over the map. Um, cool. Yeah, if you look at the FAQs on the site in the eligibility section, for, uh, it's like the first section of the creator questions. We do list out all the countries. So I know I gave you kind of a general sense of the countries, but there it kind of lists out mm -hmm. every single one. Perfect. Great. Um, cool. Okay. So another question in. Um, so basically, you're, uh, you have, it's, it's the final day of your campaign. The next day, let's say you've met your goal or exceeded it, what are like the top things you need to start cranking on right away? And then maybe on the other side of that, let's say you haven't raised your goal, what's, what does round two look like for you? Great. Um, I, yeah, either way, if you succeed or you don't meet your goal, send an update, mm -hmm. okay? And they're both really important. Okay, the one if you succeed, is the one thanking your backers. It should be celebratory. It should be saying, letting them know you're okay, you're alive, and you're really excited, because trust me, very few people are sleeping around this point as far as creators go. Let them know that you are, uh, you're you really grateful for their support, and now you are gonna go on to stage two. Now it's really gonna happen. If you don't succeed, still thank your backers. Say, thanks for, for joining me. Thank, I, you're, I really appreciate your support. Um, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, this is, this is probably not the end for what I'm doing. Um, you know, this is a time when we advise people if you don't succeed, take a break. Um, we have many creators return who didn't succeed the first time and they, they get it the second time. Mm -hmm. But this is like a chance to say, you know, take a kind of reflect on what you're doing. But either way, let thank your backers. Thank your backers, absolutely. Yeah, I think a few things like that I, that, that I see, like once you six, like let's say you succeed first, let's take that um, uh, cut. So if you succeed, um, we, we spend seven days working to, to collect pledges from your backers. Uh, during those seven days, you will get questions uh, about that. So you should be ready to, uh, at that point, just you know, send your backers 
do starter support because we can help them. You, you as the creator don't have the tools to help them get their credit card process. So that seven days will be when you're going to get a lot of questions for that. It will take about, um, it takes 14 days for us to process all the payments and another few days for the payout to arrive to the creator. So that you have about 20 days where what you can do, and that's before you actually get your money, and you can start planning, you know, like that, like doing more detailed plans around that phase. Because at that point, you'll know your quantities, you know how many people backed for your project at different levels. And, and then you can really start like figuring out like what are the, the, the steps you need to take to really, you know, finalize those deals with the manufacturers that you might have already been talking to. Um, you know, you want to map out what are still maybe those engineering challenges that you're still like you're still working on design for manufacturing. Like what are those? Like really map that out because then, you know, what you're gonna want to start doing is being more granular. Like before, when your product is live, you probably only share like a general timeline with your backers. You know, like oh, and then it's gonna take us two months to finish X and another two months to finish Y, and then we'll we'll be fulfilling and delivering. But once you get into production, you actually want to start communicating with your backers at a little bit more granular level about manufacturing and about distribution. So that gives you a little, those you know, 20 days gives you a chance to kind of prepare for that and um, really kind of, kind of set yourself to start that off well, you know, to start that process off well. Um, again, that's a period of time that you want to figure out like how you want to commit to your backers about a frequency of updates. It's okay if those updates are every two weeks or every month, but just be very transparent about that with your backers and make sure that if your updates are every month, they're probably going to be longer than if they're every, you know, two weeks. Um, be very, like, like even if you have nothing to, 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 to uh, like if everything is going fine, like send an update to your backers at the frequency you told them you're going to send it to them saying everything is fine. I don't have any big thing to report or like, you know, everything is fine. We, in the last month, have been able to check out all these boxes on our, you know, project plan to, to get you the product um, on time. Yeah, no update so, is too small. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that's that's what you, you know, what you would do. I mean, other things that you want to do as a creator is, uh, we have something called the spotlight page. Um, the spotlight page is, is, is what we call the top section of your project that once you fund, you can customize that section of your project. So you can change the, the title, you can change the, the short blurb, you can add different images to that section. And there's the button that you can send people to your own website or to somewhere else. So sometimes creators will use that to continue taking pre-orders. Um, I always suggest like only take pre-orders if you really are ready to take pre-orders. Don't feel like you have to. But, but if you do want to do that, you should try to have that set up so that as soon as your campaign ends, you, 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 you know, update the spotlight page and you start sending people to your own website or wherever you want to take those pre-orders because what you'll see is there, the traffic that will linger to your Kickstarter project will be higher in those few days after your campaign. So if you are trying to take advantage of that, you know, momentum, you want to make sure that as soon as your campaign ends, you're able to put up the spotlight page and send people to your own website and have that ready to take uh, pre-orders if that's something that you uh, right. you want to do. Or even if you can't, you're not ready to do pre-orders, just use it as an opportunity to collect their information. Just, you know, like a newsletter, just say, hey, email. Because, yeah. and it's something you could do, you set it, you can set up your spotlight page pretty much the moment you're done, like, like the actual project ends. And it looks really nice. It's like, it looks lively and engaging. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of just like this is something that it's done and you can't interact with anymore. So take advantage of that. Yeah, and and you know we always talk about the, the updates for your backers, but you know you can do public updates or private updates. Public updates are, are, are updates that are available to the whole world. So when you're doing updates, even after your product ends, you should consider that some of those updates might be something you want to do publicly. Like if you are talking about like, hey, you know pre-orders are going to be available in four months or in three months. Um, you could have a public update so that when a backer comes to your page, not only is there a button where they can go to your website and maybe sign up for an email list, but they actually can see an update where you talk about when your product will be available, because that will be very visible on your Kickstarter page. All right. So now let's flip again to the, if your product does not succeed. Um, just kind of adding to what Terry said, um, you know, you still have access to this community of people. So let's say 400 people back to your project and your product still did not succeed, you can still communicate to these 400 people via updates 
and these people, you still now have identified 400 people who are willing to give you money to help bring this thing that you're bringing to life. So you definitely should still look at them as your community and figure out like, are you running another project or are you trying to activate that interest in some other way in support of, of, of your, of, you know, your vision? Perfect. Makes a lot of sense. All right. I know, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and it's from Alan again. Um, do you guys, so you recently, um, Kickstarter recently kind of is shaking things up a little bit, kind of turning itself into a public benefit corporation. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about what that means, how that might impact the projects you guys are interested in and just, you know, I mean, where all that's coming from? I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the core thing there is I know that from the outside it seems like that's a big shift, but I think for us from the inside, I think we're not working differently. It's like, like the, all the commitments we've made as a public benefit, corporations are commitments that we already had internally mm -hmm. and that reflect ways that we were already working internally. So the way we've curated projects all along will continue to be the way that we do. And I think, you know, we, I think talking to creators, you know, like we don't use our our features as like ad placements. We actually use our features. Uh, we have a curation team that really focuses on finding products that they feel are aligned with our brand, that they feel you know are good examples for other creators as, as like you know um, good examples of how to bring to life a story. Uh, they're compelling products to backers, and those are things we're going to continue to do. So it's not really I think changing that much. I think it's more like just spelling out our commitment to those things. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, of the, you know, a lot of what that charter spells out is our commitment to supporting communities of, of creators, whether they're filmmakers, designers, you know, chefs, um, like that's the core of our mission and that's always going to be the core of what we're doing. Uh, and that for us, we're putting, supporting those communities, you know, before money, like money for us is a means to allowing us to, to support these communities, it's not. But but to the point that I think your your Alan might be getting to is you know our whole culture like we celebrate much more products that feel authentic than products that feel like they're a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. Which is why you know like we love videos where it's like it, it's the creator is actually part of the story and tell talk about their inspiration. It doesn't just look like some slick advertisement that could just as well be you know on television. Like though like culturally. That's not something that um, that that we embrace um, as much. So I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, to I mean that's like I, I pretty much that's pretty much how I feel too. Like we're all about authenticity and integrity. We really are very transparent about how how we operate here, and and not only you know we encourage that among our creators and our backers too, but I feel that you know the B Corp has been a way to sort of push forward and really kind of like grow as a company. Cool. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'll be sure to share the deck that I have the PDF of it with uh, everybody who tuned in and people who, um, you know, if you didn't have a chance to watch this, this will be up on YouTube shortly. So, um, you know, never fear. Um, and so just, I want to thank you both, Terry and Julio, so much for your time today. Um, this is perfect for our teams, really exciting. So um, thanks very much. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank Connor. you. Thanks. Bye.